you ready? It's the Roundtable with me, Robert Bannon. Hello, everybody. Happy Thursday. Today is February 24th, and it's a really special day here because we are here with the iconic Lonnie Price and Ann Morrison of Merrily Roll Along. And can you even think of a more adequate time or evening to spend than with these two plus Anne, uh, plus Michelle Danner is here, who is uh, has one of the premier acting schools in Los Angeles. Look, I'm on my best behavior because they're legends, okay? Ann Morrison is a musical theater icon. Lonnie is now like the director, writer, Actor, I mean, we we have to behave ourselves, everybody. We are in the we're in the room with greatness tonight, and I'm so honored and proud to be here. I want to thank uh, my friends who got me this your kid's favorite teacher shirt. I decided to wear it today when I'm, my day job as the fifth grade history teacher in North Bergen in these crazy times has definitely been an interest, interesting time to teach for sure. We'll be talking about some stuff like that at the very end of the show, but I don't want to take too much time because I want to I want to get them out here, and I know that you guys are excited to hear from them. We have pictures, we have videos, we have all sorts of stuff. So let's get moving and I'll give you my quick week in review. Here it is. I want to give a big thanks to Las Vegas. I was in Vegas last weekend uh, and you could see the view from the top of the stratosphere. Um, I I had such a beautiful, wonderful time. Um, we were very safe and, and I'm cautious of, of COVID and everything, but it, and it was open and we saw some show. That's outside the wind where we went to dinner. I want to thank everyone in Vegas for taking such good care of me and being so kind and so sweet. We got to see a whole bunch of shows that um, people sent tickets. Thank you so much to RuPaul's Drag Race. You know, they're big friends of our show. We have a lot of the drag queens on our show and um, they sent us to see the show. And I told them that I would talk about the show. It's a really fun hour and a half. And uh, take a peek at what, RuPaul's Drag Race playing right now at the Flamingo is all about. Coming through brighter than the sun and filling my Vegas fantasy. fun. Thank you. So thank you so much to RuPaul's Drag Race Live for having us out. We really appreciate it. And we'll be having some more of the queens on the show in the future. Uh, but I, the real reason I go to Vegas, the only reason I go to Vegas, the reason I will always go to Vegas is this. Now you know Oh, Barry. 12 years old. I got that Barry karaoke tape and it's been a, it's been over ever since then. So thanks to everybody uh, out there in Las Vegas that had us and I so appreciate it. It was really a wonderful time. If you want to see any of those shows, make sure to visit Ticketmaster.com. Uh, thank you so much. Finally, it's time for my shameless plug. My shameless plug this week is my show. Before we talk about all these other shows, uh, I will be doing my show and I'm excited to make, last show I did was at 54 Below. This time we're moving a little bit more downtown by uh, 10 blocks or so. I'll be at Green Room 42 on uh, April 16th. Uh, the show is called Rewind. It's a show all about my life and the things that I loved growing up, the music I loved, the theater I loved, and we'll throw in some of my songs from my album and my information as well. So if you're in New York City and you would love to come see me, we're going to record it for possibly a live concept album. We'll see what happens, but it's definitely going down on April, the day before Easter on uh, April 16th. So thank you so much. And thank you so much um, for everybody who's been watching and uh, listening and streaming uh, the music. So um, the Unfinished Business album. So if you want more information about all of that, 
www.robertbannon.com. Uh, next week, we have the Ladies of Dance. We're changing it up. We have Brenda K. Starr and Robin S., both giant dance, disco, house freestyle music performers will be here. So we change things up every week with a different genre and style for sure. And uh, coming up soon, we have Anais Mitchell who wrote Hades Town. We have Ruth Wainwright. And we have Marilyn McCoo and Billy Davis Jr. of Fifth Dimension all coming on the show soon. So every week we bring a different genre and a different style of music. And I just want to talk to artists about art. And the crazy times we're living in, art is really what shows humanity. And it's such a noble profession to be an artist and create art and gets us out of our shows, either reflects the world or gets us an escape from the world. So it's so special to have such special artists with us uh, here today for, for sure. And uh, thank you, Patrick. I hope you're in New York for the show as well. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, before we let them on, my my mother, my little happy birthday to my mom and happy birthday to my sister-in-law this week. Uh, lots of love to them. Um, my brother is getting married in April. So today we talked about the menu finalization and all of that. I just want to say that my mom gets on me because she says that we should ask people if they would like to contribute to the show, even though it makes me feel sleazy and skeezy, you can Venmo me at R. Bannon. And every penny, I promise you, every penny that you donate goes to promote the show so that we get more eyeballs on the show and create more places for artists to speak about art in a safe, drama-free, not gossipy and salacious way. I, it's all love and we just want to have a good time. So I was talking to Lonnie Price and Ann Morrison before the show and um, Ann brought up a video and we found it on YouTube. And um, I have to show it to you. It gives me the, the song gives me the feel. Talk about Barry Manilow covered this song as well. A lot of everyone's covered this song. Um, and they're here to talk about their career, Merrily, the documentary that's on Netflix, um, all about it. So everybody take a look at this beautiful video. Um, and we're going to first show you the clip of the documentary and I'll show you the video in a moment when it's done uploading because we literally just did it a few minutes ago. Take a peek at this documentary that you could watch right now on Netflix. Judy Prince, my wife, said, why don't you do a show about kids? And I thought, you know a play you used to just love was Merrily We Roll Along. And so he suggested to me and I knew the play and thought it was a swell idea. This is Steve Sondheim, everybody. Stephen Sondheim and Hal Prince, they were like, of course, my idols. They were the gods of Broadway. They were one. There was a casting notice that they were having open calls for a new Sondheim show, and they wanted young people. Come on! There were 5,000 people that auditioned, or more, 12,000, I think, maybe. Steve Sondheim, Hal Prince, who else could have been in that room? Christ and Moses, or... <laughs> I mean, the good news is that, uh, is that you're all in the show. <laughs> I've never been happier rehearsing actors. I've never gone home sure that a show was going to be a success. I thought, this is just it. I just didn't feel for these characters. Plunks, lurches, and on several occasions, faints dead away. I've never seen rows of people leave. Here was my chance to write about these heroes of mine, and I knew the show would fail. It was a painful piece to write. That was the day before I was fired. It was like we are flying, and then suddenly we crash. What just happened here? It was the hostility that had built up towards Hal and me, and I thought, i got to get out of this. And here they are. Ta-da! Oh, 
Let's ah, so uh, it's such an honor to be here with you both. Thank you so much for joining me. Please, our pleasure. Great to be here. Um, but I I got the idea to ask ask you both to be here over the pandemic when mm -hmm. I watched the documentary, and having seen productions of it and being a little theater nerd myself, I was like, this is such an amazing story, um, and a piece of theater history. And um, I'm so honored that you both joined me. So thank you. Sure. Yeah. Well, well, before we get to the show, can I, can we just take a moment about each of you about before you made it to Broadway? Cause your stories to Broadway are quite fascinating before you got there well, um, after. <laughs> and after for sure. So, and you, you're from Wisconsin. Nope. No. Nope. Okay. Nope. Nope. I'm not actually was born in Sioux city, Iowa and was okay. raised in Chicago. I'm a Chicago, I'm a shy girl. There, my apologies. Right, right. <laughs> the, the Wisconsin probably comes because my folks taught at the last college. They were college professors at uh, George Williams College, and they had a summer program up in Wisconsin. Okay. Um, so I'd spend my summers up there, but nah. You can't believe Chicago. anything you read on the internet. I tell you, <laughs> so no, don't believe anything you read on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you bounced, now I could be wrong, you went to a bunch of fancy schools and and ended up, what was your first professional job? Well, I didn't go to a bunch of fancy schools. They were schools to me. I mean, the, the last uh, thing that I enjoyed working was at HP Studios. And then I, I left that for a while because I was asked to sing with a Korean family in nightclubs for about two and a half years. Yes. But that's a whole other evening of stories. Yes, um, we'll have to have you back. That's a good that. evening. That is that's a, a good, good story. story. That's a good story. Um, but uh, I, 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 I wanted to get my union card so I can go back to New York. And um, I did a 52-week uh, apprenticeship program at the Burt Reynolds Jupiter Theater when it was the very first year in 1979. And um, that was quite an experience because Burt had – television stars he had film stars he had uh broadway stars come down and work and um uh, probably the best training i ever had because you were it's 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 an, an apprenticeship so you're slave labor mm -hmm. but i couldn't have more fun you had to do uh 52 weeks during your equity card or do five equity shows and i did both at the same time um and i got my car and i came to new york and um so i was in new york in 1980 the uh, first thing I auditioned for was my first off-Broadway show um, called Dreamtime, working with uh, Alfred Urey for the first time and Robert Wallman. And um, then I got this little show called Keystone, which is my first regional show up at Jiva Theater, which was the show that got me to Merrily. And that's a whole other story, but we can talk about that later. Um, yeah. But so, yeah, so I was, I was the, the, the thing that you see in the documentary where everybody's cast, I'm not in that. I didn't come till about my birthday, actually, on April 9th, uh, a few months later. Um, and then um, then we had this this amazing experience. Well, um, I, was digging, I was digging around back on that Internet, and I had read about you in the Burt Reynolds Dinner Theater, and I read <laughs> about your first television appearance on the Dinah Shore Show. Yeah. And take a peek at this. Oh, For Merrily. That is a, amazing. <laughs> so cool. I love it. Well, Lonnie, you're 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 an East Coast guy. I'm afraid now to say where you're from. I want to make sure I get it right. Are you you're originally from New York? Did you move to New Jersey? That's right. Um, I spent the first 10 years in Queens. Uh, but yes, then I moved to New Jersey uh, for about five years from 10 to 15, and then I was back in the city. Uh, and I'm still here, as the song says, you know. Well, you also look here. They're still mm. talking about Anne's high C. I, I know that's that's the whistle. Oh, that's gone. <laughs> <laughs> it's all gone. 
Lonnie, you also went to a bunch of fancy schools too. You know, you both have, are pretty fancy. <laughs> I guess, yeah. I mean, well, I, I went to performing arts high school, the Fame High School, and then I went to Juilliard. Uh, but I dropped out of Juilliard after a year and then uh, started working around town and then um, got merrily. So, yeah. yeah. Now, can you talk about how you got in touch with in, into theater? How did you start? What, how did you find Stephen Sondheim or how Prince How Isn't there a story to to that? Yeah, yeah, I, I can, I can, I can do it quickly. Um, I went to a camp, uh, a performing arts camp, and um, Mary Rogers, Richard Rogers' daughter's daughter, Kim Beatty, was there, and we became very good friends. And um, I was incredibly nuts about Steve's work, and I had the company album on a little plastic record player that I brought with me to camp, and drove everybody nuts. And uh, she said, "Oh, that's my uncle Steve," and then. Um, when um, an ad came out for a benefit, people have the Scrabble album that, that I don't know if people know that it was the first real benefit in 1973. Right. And um, I wrote to Mary cause the ad that they put in the time said uh, paid for by the friends of Stephen Sondheim. And I knew Mary was a friend and I wrote to her saying, he's my God. And can you help me get tickets? Cause I only have $25. And she sent the letter to Steve and Steve uh, wrote to me. So, uh, and then very, uh, probably he regretted he had his return address on the envelope. And uh, <laughs> that was probably a big mistake. And uh, I started writing to him and, and he always wrote back and he invited me over to his house for a chat. When, and he was, he was really, really wonderful to me. And uh, it was funny, you know, you're watching the, I don't know how you felt, Danny, but watching just the promo for the, you know, the uh, trailer of Merrily, just seeing Stephen Hal, it just made oh, me feel- I know. You know, they uh, are so much I'm a part still, of our lives. I'm still not over it that they're not yeah. here anymore. Yeah, like, it's just very, you know, they were so vital and so mm -hmm. alive and so. Um, and so good to us, you know, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. Hal was Uncle Hal. I know, that's right. To the very end. Um, and he loved you, Annie. I mean, he. Yeah, well, loved I loved him back. So it really much. made you feel like part of the family. And yeah. Steve was like a big kid, you know, during the whole marriage. He loved you, he got excited. It was fun to watch him come in to rehearsal. He was like a big old kid. He was having such the best time. It's true. Um, yeah. 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 And so dear. And he's a, a wonderful mentor. And uh, he mentored my son, Huck. That's right. Um, and he's just, uh, he really believed in young people. And to the bitter end, he was, um, I'm going to start crying. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what I think has been, I hope that, um, I don't think uh, the love for, of the Broadway community and theater community around the world for for both of them, giants, uh, yeah. creative geniuses. I don't think that can ever touch the amount of joy and music and love that they gave to the world. And I, their legacy will absolutely live forever on okay. theaters and stages everywhere, forever. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. you both are such an integral part in that as well. Well, I know, Lonnie, don't you feel like this is, it's an end of an era yeah. You know, it feels like we're now names in a history book in some strange way, yeah. but uh, we get to keep the legacy going. Yeah, you know, and our I, children. I'm sorry, I brought that up because I, I I was like a buzzkill with that with that. No, no, no it's Steve. okay. Uh, but no. um, anyway, uh, yeah, it's the I, elephant I, in the room. We have to talk this, about it. <laughs> it is, yeah, yeah. Um, what I loved, and while we're on the topic, um, we, if we can just continue for a moment, and we'll get back to uh, some fun L Lonnie video in a minute um, that I, we dug up. Uh, <laughs> I um, what I'm I loved terrified. was I'm terrified right now. No, you talked <laughs> yeah, about the I am. I'm terrified. <laughs> <laughs> the letter that you got, all of the letters that people posted from Mr. Sondheim, from Stephen himself, like mm -hmm. the, he was, the letters, he was just an, uh, a fan of people and work. He wasn't, he didn't seem like, he just was rooting for people and sending support. And when I saw that clip of you in the, in the documentary talking about how you got in touch with him and how you worked with them and then got to be in the show, it was, it's out of a, it's out of a movie. It's like, yeah, to it is. it's kind of an MGM kind of, you know, Mickey Judy kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. It, and it's just true, but uh they were like that. They both were like that. They were both um, incredibly generous with their time and uh, loved young people and uh, loved, uh, opened the door for all of us and said, come on in, you know, and made mm -hmm. us feel uh, important and special and, uh, and coming from them, it meant a lot. So, right. And during know. Merrily, I mean, of course, Daisy Prince 
his daughter was in the show. Yeah. Um, but we are, the beautifully unique thing about this, and I don't think any other Broadway cast can boast this, especially not the way we can. We actually went into the first day of rehearsal as friends. Yeah. And by the end, we were old friends. Mm -hmm. We had aged together mm -hmm. so, so drastically. Um, but no, because we, we were cast so early and we did everything together. We did picnics in Central Park together. Um, we uh, w went on outings together. Uh, we did uh, dance classes with Ron Field in the summertime yeah. to, to get ready. And uh, so the first day of rehearsal was like so unusual. We knew each other so well. Yeah, that's absolutely so. Yeah. And, and to this day, what is this, 40 years later? Yep. Uh, 42 years later, whatever. Um, we um, are still dear friends. It's true. We, have, we still email each other as a huge blog, you know, and um, keep in contact. And it's just, uh, I don't think any other Broadway company has the has the connection that we have and kept it for so well, long. Agreed. Yeah. Well, I think your, your journey and the show's journey is so unique in and of itself because the show has lived on, is timeless. And as it shows in the documentary and as we've seen in productions everywhere, that people have such an interest in the show and the story. And the, but the show, I mean, the, the, the spoiler alert it, at that time was devastating. Like it was, and I know we're jumping ahead here in the story, but it was quite, um, the it, it was it was not an easy time i'm sure for any of you when you got hired and booked to do it even no contact. and and some of the cast members it kind of they felt like it was it ruined them they got ruined by it i mean i think when i when i think when i read when sondheim said that he felt betrayed by his theater community you know i i remember watching the audience go up the aisle and hearing word around town during the previews, such bad mouthing, I was so disappointed in my theater community because I thought mm -hmm. that's not the way I play, you know. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, it was devastating because we didn't go out of town to try out. No, we kept it, we kept it in town. That was. I hard. was going to. I read about that. You okay? So you you guys get cast in this show, and if you watch the documentary on Netflix, it's still there. The, they show the cast. They see you guys in the audition room. All of that amazing footage, Except and me. then. <laughs> Except Anne, who just came in later, and when you guys are working on this, the the the, the folklore of the show. I mean, the shirts and the names and the idea, yeah. the show backwards and the whole thing about it. Um, what was going through your minds through the rehearsal? You had fifty pre, pre fifty preview performances. No Boston, no Denver, no San, no no out of town tryouts. Actually, it was forty four and sixteen performances, so it was sixty performances altogether. Um, mm -hmm. Well, I'll tell you, the uh, the thing that fascinates me the most is what when we finally got to the theater and we started the preview process. Um, because I, that's where Sondheim is and Steve uh, and, and Hal are probably, well, especially Hal. That's where his magic happens, when a preview happens. He really pays attention to the audience and he tweaks and he sees and he fixes. And some of the most brilliant things that happen in uh, getting the show to where we thought we were actually going to have a nice run all happened when they made those discoveries during that time. So that, that whole 42, 44 performances um, were grueling and exciting. And Lonnie, you know, we gave up our days off. Uh, we mm -hmm. wanted this thing to work so badly. So we were now working with no day off. That day off was now in rehearsals. Uh, and it wasn't a volunteer thing that we wanted to do. I, I, I have a permanent system, my vocal cord from that show. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, hey, what can you say? Uh, and, and I think one of the reasons why people love the album so much, the original album more than any of the other albums, is you can really hear the emotions behind it because we had to record that the next day after closing. 8.30 in the morning, we were in, in the, the um, RCA and it was, uh, it, I think it, it, was, it, was, it was sad, <laughs> terribly sad to watch Steve in the control room being so emotional because he really loved this experience with us all. Um, so yeah, it was a, uh, that whole preview period is what I'm interested in. I'm, I'm going to be doing a show at 54 below on May the 17th. And Oh, look at us. Look at us. How young we are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh dear. Um, we, uh, uh, and I, I'm one of, I'm focusing, it's calling it merrily from center stage. 
um, because there are some things that I didn't get a chance to talk about that I'd like to talk about. And I'm an actor. I'm not a historian. So I'm, I'm more interested in how we all felt about stuff. And it's going to be a lot of fun. You know, it's going to be a lot of fun. But I, I'm, focus, I'm more focused on that particular show, What Happened to Us in the Previews. Well, it's uh, like we said, it's it's theater legend now. I yeah. mean, you changing actors and changing the story. How much change? How many changes were put in during a preview period? Did you guys get new pages? Did you have to learn new blocking? Oh God, yes. We would get we would get pages. We would memorize it, being told that they they may not stay in the show. So you memorize it to get through that night, and then we'd go into rehearsal the next day to see if any of that was going to stick. And then there would be other rewrites, and then something else would happen, while the 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 rest of the company was in hours and hours and hours of changing transitions. Where they say, "Wait, we're doing transition seven, but we're doing the third one." Okay, now we're going to go back to. It was just, it was insane. But we were young, and we wanted it to work. We we were. Sure. I I think at the same times, I did feel like I had a nervous breakdown at one point during the the previews because we had uh, Ron had been fired. Um, or left or whatever. That's another story in itself. That's uh, Larry, for, for yeah. 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 Larry Fuller came in to, who was a sweetheart and was very gentle, all of us to make some changes that um, the communication between him, how he and how were wonderful. And, uh, but there were, there was a time where we had five major changes in the show and I was curled up in the, the stairwell going down to the basement, uh, just tears pouring down my face. Cause I don't think I can do this anymore. And um, uh, we did it. But, uh, well, that's, you'll come to May 17th and I'll tell you all about that one. <laughs> I can't wait. I, can't wait. Uh, just, you know, I mean, I, everything Annie is saying, of course, is true. Yeah. Um, but but I have to say that um, uh, it was also a joyful experience. Yeah. Oh, God, yes. It was yes. a lot of fun. That's the and, thing that people um, don't And get. they trusted us. And they never made us feel like we were the problem. Uh, they sheltered us from all kinds of negativity. Yeah. They celebrated us yeah. and, um, you know, they probably gave us more changes than you'd give, uh, you know, older people who would have balked, but we didn't know we could say no. no. And we didn't and, want well, to. Well, and that's true because um, when, I, what when, I thought I was, when I thought I was going to lose it and we had five major changes and the last one was opening doors and that fiasco. And um, the next day, Hal came up to my dressing room and he said, I owe you an apology. I have no idea what it's like to memorize and do what you guys are doing. And, um, and you have to let us know when it's too much. We didn't, you know, we just, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He told me the famous story about Ethel Merman calling, call me bird's eye. I'm frozen. Um, he says, you have to tell me when it's frozen. So anytime after that, do you remember this Lonnie? Um, yeah. He would give us a change and he'd turn to us and say, is that okay? <laughs> Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. That's good. That's good. <laughs> well, Lonnie, you're you're a director, and I mean, how Prince is how Prince, and um, and I know that as an actor, the, you know, and and you have being the unique situation, both of you as as coaches and teachers, and, and have had long careers, you know, the actor's job is to perform the director's vision. Yeah. Um, and what was it like as a director, Lonnie, to work with someone like Hal? And what do you take into your directing now that you may have learned then? Um, uh, it, it's it's a wonderful question. Um, I think, you know, what I always say, what I learned from both Hal and Sadiv is respect, is that they just had so much respect for um, everyone in the building. You know, the stage door man, the woman who sewed on sequins or, you know, they, they just, um, they knew it was all, we were all needed and we all had a part in it. And um, nobody was more valuable than another person. And they just treated us with great kindness and respect. Um, I, something that came to mind, which is always, interesting to me is when I first got uh, Franklin Shepard Inc., that sort of long patter song that I did, and it came in very late, and Steve would come up to me and say, you know, I know that doesn't scan. I, you know, I'm working on it. I'm sorry. Would you please? And he was apologizing to yeah, me. That's you know, and it was just like, I'm 21 years old. This is a gift from God, the song, the show, everything. And he felt badly that he wasn't giving me what he considered better material, which in his <laughs> less sensational material is still heads and shoulders above everybody else who ever wrote anything. So again, it, and I don't think it was about me. It was about uh, his respect for the person performing that song. Exactly. And he, we were in that position. And so we, we became Angela Lansbury. We mm -hmm. became whoever that would have been who were the leads of any of the shows he'd done. Exactly. 
So yeah, I, that was really kind of really amazing, wasn't well, and it? And I, I think in the beginning, you know, we were all so insecure. Mm -hmm. uh, I was sure any minute I was going to be fired. They were going to find out I was dyslexic. And that would be the end of that. And I didn't think I looked like someone who would star on Broadway. So I had all that insecurity going on, too. But they never made us feel that way. Mm -mm. In fact, Steve caught it with me at one point and came around and said something like, um, you know, Gussie isn't a very nice person because it was a it was a joke in the show uh, during right after um, old friends in the apartment. And Gussie comes in wanting to let everyone know that she's going to redo the entire uh, apartment in hues of anemones. And she had little swatches of material and she went up to Charlie and said chair. And then she went chair, chair. And she came up to Mary Flynn and said sofa. And it's a great laugh line. But I remember feeling like, am I a sofa? <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't think I'm a person that would star on Broadway. And I think Steve caught that because he said, you know, Gussie's not a very nice person. You're doing great. So he was sensitive to, yeah. Um, and so after that, I don't think we felt that way anymore. We really felt like we were, we belonged where we belonged, you know? Well, one of the things that I, I, I love um, in this, it feels to me as an outsider and as a fan, that there's a, been a, a circular m movement to this show. You know, I'm, I'm sure in the moment it was devastating and I'm sure it was embarrassing and I'm sure there was lots of regrets or questions or an insecurity, young actors brand new to Broadway. Okay. But there seems to have been the turnaround of the show getting recognized. But also, um, I like the, the title, Lani, of the documentary because it's kind of that full circle moment where things kind of happen the way that they're supposed to and maybe it makes more sense. How long do you, and does it still stay with you? Do you think things happen the way they were supposed to? Is there still regret? Is, is it now something you hold ownership of that this was something you needed to learn and move you somewhere else? Well, I, I don't know. I, I don't know how Annie feels about it. I mean, I, I we just didn't have any control. I mean, we just, you know, so we were, I can't say we were victims, but we, you know, we just, yeah. um, I I don't regret it now. I mean, I sure did then. I, I wished, but, um, and I, I think that the show has taken on so much, um, uh, I don't know, history or something and love over yeah. the years that it has healed, mm -hmm. you know, all of that. I mean, Annie, you felt that way. I know at the reunion Absolutely. concert that that, that healed. Absolutely. I felt that that was 21 years before we made our Broadway debut in a sweatshirt. And 21 years later, we were in evening gowns and, and you know, lo and looking beautiful. 21 years before, the audience was walking up the aisle. And 21 years later, they were standing on their feet like they were at a rock concert. Mm -hmm. And 21 years before, um, Hal Prince and Stephen Sondheim were not going to be working together. And 21 years later, they were hugging each other, announcing the next project. It was a, a tremendous healing. And anyone who didn't get a chance to be a part of that missed that really wonderful healing of that reunion. Um, and, it and we continue to heal. I mean, one of the beautiful things, we have Zoom meetings every once in a while mm -hmm. after, you know, 40 years. And, and little things will pop up and we'll say, do you know, while you were doing that, this was happening in the other room. Oh, I didn't even know that happened, you know. Um, it's it's well, quite lovely. The cast, the extended cast of that show are no slouches. That is a all-star lineup mm -hmm. of talent. Yeah. Uh, I wonder what happened to some of them. <laughs> Where yeah, are they? Whatever happened to like, well, you know, uh, Jason Alexander, 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 for instance. Bernard you know? Bernard <laughs> Bernard <laughs> Bernard <laughs> Bernard <laughs> they're all great. And they're all great people and they all found their lives in different places and which is, you know, what the documentary is about as well, you know, which is just, you know, you don't, uh, you don't have to be in show business to, and to, to have a wonderful life, obviously. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and they were fulfilled in many different ways. And, uh, and, and my so life happy, didn't happy, end happy, happy, after yeah. that. I mean, I got starred in the Western in London. I got a theater world award that year for Merrily. Um, you know, I continue to work off Broadway doing other things. I still continue to work. I also teach, all the time. you know, um, and do cabaret work and all kinds of stuff. So, um, Annie's yeah. a wonderful writer too. She writes amazing solo plays. Yeah, so, um, I love to write. Yeah, thank you, Lonnie. Thank you. Well, yeah, her her cabaret show in New York City is something that you're not going to want to miss. I know that she'll be here anytime she's somewhere. She's going to give all the stories and all the songs and that beautiful <laughs> spirit more so than her voice and a lot of comedy <laughs> and a lot of comedy. And we definitely need that. 
And then Lonnie, you know, we've seen so much of your work and people may not even realize that the, the, the Merrily guy is, is the, the, the brains behind these productions and, and, um, and literally stages and, and screens around that you have been on. I have to now, all right, we've waited long enough. I'll embarrass you with my footage. Oh, it's not embarrassing. Oh, it's not embarrassing. I want to see it. It might be to me, but okay. Close your eyes. Forced. I <laughs> loved the show, but I learned the show later. But when I was a child, I wouldn't go to sleep unless I watched this tape. Hey, well, what are we standing around here for? We got to find Kermit. Yeah. Let's go. Yeah. Go, 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 go. I have more. It goes on. It could have been worse. worse. That was fine. I'm not. I I love that movie. And if we we kept going, and I don't want to take time because I could sit here and watch the whole thing. The end of of it is Kermit upside down, and you're backstage, and and you come and you tell everyone that the show's going to go on. So my most prized possession, I took it off the wall, is I have this Jim Henson signed Muppets Take Manhattan uh, program from the opening, and he signed it, and I was like. Lonnie, I know all you can do. You could win Audra McDonald Tony Awards. You can be on Broadway and Marilyn. Okay, Road. okay. But you will always be the producer in Muppets Take Manhattan to me. <laughs> and proud, and proud I, to be, and proud to be. There's I want to no be in a Muppets part. film. Me too. Still yeah. Still <laughs> Lonnie, fix that for us. I will. I will. I will. <laughs> Yeah, no, that that's 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 you know, no, it's very nice that people like that film so much. Well, I have this idea, and I don't know if it's going to go anywhere. I'm going to tell it to Lonnie one more time. You know, they're doing a movie version of Merrily over 20 years, doing it backwards. Which, yeah, I, I'll probably be dead by the time it comes out. We all um, will. We all, we'll all be dead. And I think that he should put all the original cast members in the background of certain films because you know that's going to be like. Oh my God! Where's Lonnie Price in that? Oh, where's Ann Morrison? Where's yes. Jim Walton? Where's it? I think that's what they should do. I'm just putting it out there. I I, I know why you're telling me as though I have anything to do with any of that. <laughs> so I keep saying, yeah, that's a good idea, Annie. But I, I don't know the man who's directing it. I know no opinion for that. But maybe they will come to us before we die. I hopefully <laughs> before we before we die. That would be before nice. Well, yeah. Yes. You you guys, I just want to ask you. I don't want to take too much time, and I know Anna, I'm going to have you back, and Lonnie, you're welcome. You're, my show is your show. Anything Thank you have you. to say. Yeah. By the way, I love what you say at the beginning about it just being about love and kind and, and all of that. And that 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 means a lot. So no. uh, I'm sure your audience really appreciates that no. you are just um, sharing your joy of the theater with everybody. So, yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of negativity yeah. and people being bitter and there's just no room for it. You know, well, theater's always about family. I it's look at it in my little humble opinion that I represent the person that is home listening to that cast album every single day. And I have the privileged position to talk to you and I want to represent them. Well, just the same way you would as a director have a vision. My vision is I know that they're watching and I'm no, no better than them. And I just want to share the love of the art because I just am so fascinated by art and artists. And I just I have so many questions as a kid and now I'm just grown and still want the answer. So here we are. And this is just, I'll come back anytime. Hey. I've got the Korean story to tell. <laughs> I'm ready for that. That's, that's the story. Um, with the past few years, losing Hal and losing Stephen, and, and with the documentary out and interest in the movie and, and Broadway being back and after COVID and all of that, um, I just was wondering if you have a parting lesson or thought about this journey that you could, there's a lot of students who watch this show that have followed and listened to your cast albums brought you us through some really bad days. What is your mantra or lesson that you've learned battered in show business that you would like to pass on to some of the kids? And what do you say to them? I would say, uh, and I probably even say it in the documentary because I really believe it. We worked with musical theater gods and they failed and they got back on their feet and they moved on. That was a magnificent, beautiful lesson to learn that things you do things and they don't always work out. 
but you back up and you keep going. And the failure is a win somewhere else. All, everything that you do impacts what you're going to do later. Nothing that you do is a mistake ever, ever. And, and be kind. I mean, one of the things that was so beautiful when you work with really top notch people, they're not assholes. Yeah. You know, they're really wonderful people. And um, because, you know, when you go up the ladder, you meet the same people when you come back down again. And I'm meeting a lot of young people right now who have a little bit of an edge on them, you know, like, I don't have to do this. I don't do that. And I, I keep on thinking when I hear this, oh, my God, you would be fired so fast if you're working with Al Prince. <laughs> you wouldn't put up with that, you know. There was something about us being so naive, I guess, but I'm glad we were naive to want to have a good show that we would come in eager to do, give us the next thing, give us the next challenge. Let's make this work. And I, that's a good, I don't know if that's good work ethics or it's just because we love the theater and we love the people that nurtured us and loved us back. Mm -hmm. So just whatever you do, be those people, you know? I, it's gorgeous, Annie. I, and I completely agree about kindness being the most important part. Um, the other thing I would just say is, is that um, do it because you love the doing of it, not because what you think you're going to get out of it. Yeah. Um, if, if, because yeah. then it doesn't matter what the yeah. outcome is and you have no control clearly yeah. of what, and then in my experience of what the outcome of that show was in the world or whatever. Yeah. But if you love doing it, it doesn't really matter. Uh -huh. And it's too bad we didn't get to do it longer, but we love the doing of it. And uh, I don't know, Lonnie, we can't seem to get rid of that show. We're still doing it. <laughs> well, I'm not doing the show, but yeah, no, yeah. it's true. It's in our lives. Uh, but I mean, when you think about, you know, uh, you know, go be in the theater, not because you want to be famous, be in it because yeah. you love doing it. And then yeah. if you're famous, that'd be nice. And if not, that's still OK. Yeah. Um, but uh, I think people sometimes um, have expectations that are out of their control yeah. and uh, color their love of it because they're not getting something that they yeah. think they need from it. But if you just love doing it, then you got it. That, yeah. that is in your control. The love you have yeah. of doing it is in your control. So uh, without being too philosophical, that's what yeah. I would say about that. Just no. be it. Yeah, you don't have to worry about the doing it. Just be it. Well, people are commenting now that it, they love it. It's beautiful. Someone here says, fascinating backstage stories with Anne and Milani. What a terrific opportunity to work with Sondheim and Hal Prince, two giants. That That is hey, definitely- May 17th, 54 below. You'll know more. <laughs> May, May 17th. And we have I have that for you, right? We're going to put it back on the screen. You can go. And yeah. Lonnie's just back from uh, from Ireland when we were trying to get you on the show. I, I'd asked about a, a month or so ago, and they're like, he, he may do it, but he's, he's a little busy right now directing, you know. Uh, so welcome back. Thank and congrats, you. On, congrats on all of that work. And I am yes, sure, I am sure there is going to be a lot more uh, work and stories and tales to tell from Ann Morrison and, and from you, Lonnie. So thank you so, so thank much you. for thank both you. of you for being here. You, you, guys, you guys made a lot, of theater, a lot of theater fans really happy tonight. So much love and thanks, thanks for, so for asking us. Thank thanks everybody for tuning in. Thank yeah. you guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. How sweet. Sweet and beautiful are they? We're going to show old friends uh, the entire clip. It's uploaded now at the very end of the show. So, and we're going to show it. Lonnie, we're going to show it. And we're going to show it. So, if you're if you those uh, those fans out there, we have that special clip for you uh, at the end of the show today. Uh, up next, I'm excited. You know, talking about artists, talking about art. Uh, that's the whole point of the show, and um, talking about being good at your craft, learning your craft. Well, uh, that's an important thing. You better have a toolbox and be ready because if you plan on being an actor or a mus in musical theater or in television or film, um, it's good to know what you're talking about, right? Well, Michelle Danner is here. Take a peek at this and then she'll be here live. Welcome to our online interactive classes. Learn the craft of acting with our top Hollywood acting coaches and directors. Our acting philosophy uses acting techniques from Stella Adler, Sanford Meisner, Michael Chekhov, Uta Hagen, Lee Strasberg, and Stanislavski to help you create your own toolbox, your very own golden box. Get a chance to experience live acting classes, perform with other actors, and get feedback from your teachers live. Play, stretch your imagination with our improvisational classes, analyze scripts, and much more all online with us. There is something for everyone, all from the comfort of your home. 
Our classes are practical, hands-on, interactive. You will definitely find a sense of community here as you work with other creative people. I will see you online. Well, Michelle Danner, hello. Hi. Yeah, that's, that was something I taped before, you know, like as we were entering the pandemic. Uh, and I have, and, and when you were virtual and now you're back, you're in person. Yeah, we're in person. We're also virtual, but we're in person. So uh, which is great. But this brings me back to when I was taping this. And uh, yeah, it reminded me of. Those we were all so much swimming in uncertainty and trying to figure out, are we going to, because we had, we had shut down the in-person classes, but can we continue to be creative online? And the answer now is yes, we have been able to be creative online. I've done a lot of Zoom interviews like this one sure. online. And so, yeah, thank you for well, having me. Oh, please. I'm so happy to have you here because not only are you, you know, one of the premier acting coach and acting school in, in the Los Angeles area and around the world now, now, um, but you know, you're also a director and a writer and have, I don't know, done a lot of, a lot of films, worked with a lot of amazing people and a lot of amazing people have been your students. Um, I am fascinated as someone who I, okay, I went to, I went to acting school. I'm from New Jersey, so I'm, I'm on the East coast. So uh, I, I went to acting school. I did a conservatory program, um, but I'm really fascinated about your technique because I had heard, Michelle, that people tend to only pick one style or one teacher. And I know you studied with Stella Adler and Uta, Uta, uh, Uta Hagen and, and did all of this as your technique. You've created your own kind of technique that combines a little bit of everyone. Yes. Uh, I have. Um, my technique uh, encompasses all the techniques that I've studied with. You know, I was lucky enough to study with Stella Adler, with Uta Hagen. Uh, I've studied the Meissner technique. And anytime I sat in an acting class, I was, um, um, you know, there's something that's playing outside of my door, believe it or not. I'm so sorry. No, These, no really. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> My assistant is going and, and trying, the, you know, with everything that's nope. happening in the world today, <laughs> I have these two strangers that have entered my home, but it's fine. My, my assistant's dealing with it. Okay. Um, it's so I, was, don't... <laughs> I was talking to you about the golden box, which, yeah. you know, I studied with Stella when I was a teenager and I loved Stella Adler. I loved Uta Hagen. But one of the things as I sat through all those iconic teachers classes, one of the things that always you know, threw me aback was this idea of dogma that you can only do it one way. You should do it this way. I hated that imposition. I felt art needed to be, you know, more elastic than that. And also I, I believe in progressive education. I have two kids. I send them to progressive schools. I think you have to evolve with the times, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, in this toolbox that every artist has to put together for themselves when they're on set and they're breaking down a script and creating a character, or you were just talking about, you know, these wonderful Broadway folks and working mm -hmm. on Broadway shows. And, you know, that you have to have a very unique, I don't believe in this idea that artists cannot be with art, that everybody mm -hmm. needs to come to the middle and be the same. You know, everyone is different and everyone's unique and every artist has to develop their very own golden box. And so, um, and of course, all the different uh, techniques that are out there, whether it's the Sandy Meisner technique or the method or Stella Adler's technique, all these techniques um, are valuable. And you, you take the gold in each one of them in terms of what works for you. And, um, and then you apply it to, to your work as an actor. Well, can we show a little clip of you talking about it? Would you like to see a little bit sure, about it? Sure, let me see what you have. <laughs> ah. Hi, I'm Michelle Danner. I have developed a technique called the Golden Box that is taught at the studio where artists can draw upon all different teachings, Adler, Meisner, Strasberg, Hagen, Chekhov, and Stanislavski. Every actor is unique, and so it's important when they script analyze and build a character, whether it be for film, television, or stage, that they find concepts, tools that specifically work for them. 
Our philosophy is when it comes to the craft of acting, every artist should form a toolbox, their very own golden box. I'm looking forward to talking to you about it when I see you. Well, it's fascinating to me, for sure, um, how how that works. Um, I, you know, I, I was a Meisner. I went to Meisner Conservatory training. So it's fascinating to me that, um, and I love the idea that you have different uh, different different projects and different roles and different scripts and things can call for a different style. Oh, yeah. I think that, you know, the actor today has to be so, you know, well-read and has to watch so many things and enrich themselves with different cultures and travel. I mean, obviously, it's been difficult to travel in the last few years, but, you know, things hopefully will change, of course, you know, watching the news today. Things look a little grim, but, um, you know, we'll get past this too, everything everything, nothing stays the same. And, uh, and so, you know, yeah, the, you know, an actor has to enrich themselves with so many things so that they can be the best storytellers that they yes. can be in and share, you know, humanity with, with audiences. Well, and that's what I learned, you know, act, acting is, is humanity. It's a noble act, profession uh, and it is something that reflects humanity. And when people look back in history, besides a boring history book, they look back to the culture and the art that's created. So it's such an important job, especially in these crazy times, like you're saying. So tell us a little bit about your school. Tell us a, 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 if, you, if you don't mind. Yes, we have a, a wonderful school, a beautiful school in Culver City. As a matter of fact, uh, it's, it's, it's a vibrant corner that we have. Uh, with a great outdoor space. If you're driving from um, the ocean, driving into Hollywood, a mural artist painted on the wall, you can't spell heart without art. And if you're driving from Hollywood in, into the, you know, from the east to the west, on the other side of it, you cannot make art without heart. So we have these two wonderfully, beautifully lit signs. And uh, we have a theater and we have... Um, you know, a, a classroom and an outdoor space. And, uh, and people come from all over the world to study. Uh, we have a conservatory with programs. And we try as much as possible to give, you know, um, experiences, fulfilling experiences to our actors so they can go out in the world and make a difference. I well, mean... Yes. I've been lucky, you know, I've, I've, I've taught so many wonderful, wonderful students. And, you know, so often I look at a movie or I look at a TV show and I go, oh, well, you know, there's that person or there's, you know. Yeah, people like Selma Hayek and Chris Rock and Penelope Cruz and Seth MacFarlane and la, 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 and on and on and on. It goes to the people that you've helped work with. It also helps when the owner of the studio and the acting teacher is uh, a producer and a director of films as well, because you know what's really going on in the industry. Well, yes, it does. I think that it, it has made me certainly a you know better acting teacher because I'm in the trenches and I've rolled up my sleeves and I know what it takes to deliver a performance in front of the camera. Um, I'm very, uh, I have been really lucky. I, I've gotten the opportunity to do one movie practically after the next. And I'm in pre-production as we speak. I'm going to shoot uh, a movie in June. Oh, in May. <laughs> so it's around the corner. I'll blink and we'll be there. And it's a great movie about the Miranda rights. You know, I, I have used in... Uh, other movies that I've done, The Runner, this movie behind yeah. you, um, you know, you have the right to remain silent, anything can be used, you know, you have a, your right to an attorney. And, you know, I never questioned, where did that come from? But, well, that movie's never been made. That story's never been told. And finally, um, you know, we're telling the true story. Uh, th this woman, you know, has kept it a secret for 60 years. But there's a story, obviously, it's called Miranda, uh, Miranda's victim. And uh, we're going to be we're going to be telling that story. And it's a very important story. In addition to the fact that it changed, you know, the law, it changed the legislature in our in our country. Well, that's a that's a fascinating. What a great idea. I, I, I mean, my, my family are all police officers. My brother's a police officer. And I know, you know, you hear about Miranda rights and reading your rights. Where did that come from? Who is it? What is it all about? It came from 1963 in Arizona. Well, Michelle Danner, if you you know if you need a blonde haired blue eyed guy in New Jersey who's an Italian Irish actor, um, <laughs> 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 right. 
I, um, uh, There's a lot of parts in this movie. That's it's it's a huge cast. I, and I come cheap. <laughs> I'm cheap. Um, speaking of the runner, I want people to see a piece of your work. Do you mind if we see a clip of the runner because sure. it's gorgeous? Okay. Looks gorgeous. What a, what a you. beautiful cinematography and and job. Take a peek at uh, uh, the last movie that it was the last movie you released, right? Yeah. Uh, no, it's not out yet. Oh, it's okay. Distributed by Saban Films, uh, late spring. Amazing. Well, here. Well, then we have a little peek, sneak peek for you right now. Here's the runner. This morning was a favor. <laughs> Answering your cry for help. I got you on tape, Aiden Albers. We can either be tried as an adult, <laughs> or we can wipe the slate clean. What do you want? Oh, just, uh, everyone. You don't look like you're sleeping well. You look worn out. I've been making the money. You've been watching my back. So how about you ask me a real fucking question then, huh? I don't think you want me to ask you a real what question. What is it that you're dying to know? Did you work for what's in that bag? What's it like having so much? I look at you and I don't even think you know that I love you. This shit is getting out of hand, bro. I don't like it. I don't like the sound of this. You're scaring me. You ain't got a spark. You got a motherfucking bonfire. Now I'm gonna need to hear you say it, Aiden. Say it. I, I, I don't... Initiate. Go, go, go. <laughs> Fucking say it. I'm not gonna fuck this up. You can't outrun all you've done. Wow, that is you talk about heart pounding. It, it, but besides that, it looks it looks beautiful. It looks really Thank beautiful. You. Thank you. I had a wonderful director of photography, um, Pierluci Malavasi. He's Italian. <laughs> I just came on the phone with him right before I came to do this interview because he's also going to be my director of photography for this next project, Miranda's Victim. Well, I'm so excited to see it, and I'm so excited to see what's to come. People, are you are you? A, how do you enroll? Are you an ongoing enrollment at the school? How can people get more information? Yes, yes absolutely. You can go to uh, Michelle Danner. Uh, Dot com Michelle uh, Los Angeles Acting Conservatory. We have individual classes. We have well-rounded programs, three months, six months, a year, two years with filmmaking programs. So yeah, you can just go online and check it out. And if you follow you on, on social media or if people follow you on your website, you'll be able to see when the films are coming out and all of the, all everything that is Michelle Danner. Michelle Danner, LA on Instagram. And yeah. I, uh, I'm so excited. I come back and forth to LA and one day I'm going to have to come in and, and see your oh, yeah. uh, see you school. I, I, I want to see the school because I just love to nerd out and talk about acting and technique all day, every day. So um, right. I'm very excited. If you if you're in the Los Angeles area or anywhere in the world now, you can reach out and get information. Go to michelledanner.com and, and learn from the best and the people who are doing it right now. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. I so appreciate you spending some time with us, and I look forward to seeing what's next for for you. And I appreciate you. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. And that's Michelle Danner, everyone. What a wonderful person and what a wonderful teacher and what a great for her to spend some time with us for today. Um, if you don't mind, if you have four more minutes before I show you the merrily we roll along uh, old friends to say goodnight, I just want to say, um, and I was thinking about this all day, you know, I'm a school teacher in real life besides an actor and a performer in my talk show extravaganza. And um, a lot of things have been going on in the world today and I feel like I need to address them. So I just wanted to say a couple of things. Um, one, uh, I hope that we are all doing well with everything that is going on in the world today, especially with the things that are going on today with Ukraine and Russia. We stand, um, not to be political about the show, but democracy was founded in this country so that we can create freedom for all people. That in includes people to be, have the right to choose who their government is and their leaders are. And um, I hope that we remember who we are as a country because a lot of the times the past few years, I feel like we've definitely forgotten. So America is a beacon of freedom. And my grandfather came here as an illegal immigrant 
to come here to be free for his family. Your families came here from somewhere too. And we have to remember that people are allowed to live in an area where they're not bombed, murdered, and killed because they don't want to belong to something that used to be. And I hope that we remember that and we are, we're there for people. If you don't want to listen to my show because I talk like this, that's fine. That's okay. Um, lastly, I want to just say there are laws and rules. It's not only in Russia and the Ukraine, especially in Russia with LGBT rights that are going that are under attack in this very country. The children that live on your block, your relatives and your families, they're under attack by this government, by state governments. Take a peek at what's going on with this video. Trans equality now. Trans identities have become a political tool this session, and I think we've been seen this growing over the years. It is so harmful to see this legislation happening and to see the targeting of youth within our nation. It's time that lawmakers stop picking on trans kids and start focusing on the real issues rather than making transgender kids their political punching bag. I am somebody who is living just like the rest of you. And I'm somebody who just wants to live without any discrimination like the rest of you. Transgenders participating in women's sports will destroy women's sports. Should a child be subjected to things that they could not undo, that they may have made a decision differently, Courts have interpreted Title IX of the Education Amendments of 1972, which prohibits sex discrimination to protect trans students. So when we tell trans students that they're not able to play sports, that they're not able to use a restroom that matches with their gender identity, that they're not able to access the breadth of services that should be available to them within their school system, what we're saying is that you don't have a place here. House Bill 1570 would put the state as the definitive oracle of medical care overriding parents, patients, and healthcare experts. This is an FDA not approved procedure. This is experimentation on children. This bill does not deny health care. We've seen legislators introduce bills that are designed to strip away health care from transgender youth, perpetuating really false understanding of what it means to transition. And stripping this health care away from young people is not only dangerous, but really can affect their mental health as well. We are losing a majority of our youth simply due to blatant discrimination and the fact that they do not see hope in the future. My overall experience dealing with these bills has been the horrible thought that I'm going to have to see another one of my friends get buried in the ground. I lost two people already over the past year to suicide and I've seen so many LGBT kids messaging me saying that they're scared because they're going to get their hormones taken away. I've sent people messaging me crying because they're not going to be able to play on the team that they want to play on. And I've seen people's lives changed because of these bills, for the good and for the worse. It takes one adult to see that youth wholly and authentically and willing to support them that reduces that risk of suicide. And so by rolling back these legislative actions, by banning them, by vetoing them, we are going back and affirming that trans students have a place here and that we do want you to survive and not only survive, but thrive. Trans kids are just like every other child. It really just takes getting to know who the trans student is, what's best for them in their particular situation, and helping them integrate fully into the classroom and the school environment. To all the trans people who may not have the most welcoming environment out there, you always are going to have a family with us. You are always going to be welcomed, you are always going to be valued, and you are always going to be accepted and included in a space that we're in. So listen, 
as an educator and as someone that's in a classroom every single day with students, these students need love and support. They're people. So the more that you know someone and get educated about who they are, you can't hate a group of people when you know them as individuals. So Texas and Florida and these other states around the country, you're gonna open a can of worms that you don't wanna open because taking away hormones, taking away rights, incriminating parents for not reporting that their kids are trans or, or forcing people out of the closet, there will be blood on your hands, sadly. Th this is a, the rate of suicide for trans and LGBT people is astronomical. And that is something that we need to speak out upon because as the United States for liberty and justice for all, that includes everybody. So I would like, th thank you, Christine. I, I, I appreciate, um, I can't sit quietly uh, if I'm grateful enough to have a platform with five people or 5,000 people, 10,000 people watched the show last week, you know, on YouTube, somebody needs to hear this message. We see you, we support you and we're voting and we're voting next week. We're dancing next week. We, <laughs> what a transition. Robin S is here. Brenda K star is here. We're spending the hour at a nineties dance party. So if you're an eighties baby like me, odds are you probably were in some club and Sam, Mike, Adrian, are you out there? You were dancing with, to these songs with me as well. Um, we will be talking about dancing next week, so it'll be fun. Everybody, thank you, Lanny Price. Thank you, Ann Morrison. Thank you, Michelle Danner. Thank you all for being here. I appreciate you so much. Uh, love yourself and love yours. And uh, we'll be here next week. I appreciate you. Stay focused, stay on top of and be love and kindness to one another. Here's the cast of Merrily We Roll Along singing one of my favorite, favorite Stephen Sondheim songs of all time. Old friends, from me to you. God bless you. Have a good night, everybody. Who's like us? Damn few. Hey, old friend, are you okay? Old friend, what do you say? Old friend, are we or are we unique? Time goes by everything else keeps changing you and i we get continued next week most friends fade or they don't make the grade new ones are quickly made and in a pinch sure they'll do but us old friend what's to discuss old friend here's to us who's like us damn few so old friend fill me in slow old friend start from hello old friend i want the when where and how old friends do tend to become old habit never knew how much i missed you till now <laughs> most friends fade or they don't make the great new ones are quickly made some of them were something too but us old friends what's to discuss old friends to tell you something Good friends point out your lies, whereas old friends live and let live. Good friends like and advise, whereas old friends love and forgive. And old friends let you go your own way. Help find your own way. Let you off when you're wrong. If you're wrong. When you're wrong. Right or wrong, the point is old friends should should, but not for too long. What's too long? If you're wrong. You're wrong. Oh, the just... thing is, old friends do leave their brands on you, but old friends shouldn't compete. Old friends don't make demands on you. Should make demands on you. Well, don't make demands you can't meet. Well, what's the point of demands you can meet? Well, there's a time for demands. 
whether you meet them or not. Then so obnoxious. You're giving me your condescending, Have a laugh a minute. One day comes and they're a part of your lives. New friends pour through the revolving door. Maybe there's one that's more. If you find one that'll do. But us old friends, what's to discuss? Old friends, here's to us. Who's like us? Two old friends, few will won't do. Old friends, gotta have two old friends helping you balance so long. One up, raise you for your faults and fancies. One persuades you that the other one's wrong. Most friends fade or they don't make the great new ones are quickly made perfect as long as they're new. But us old friends, what's to discuss? Old friends, here's to us. Oh, that's not so easy anymore. Who's like us?